Many of Indonesia's 17,000 islands appear quite peaceful and serene, almost like paradise on Earth. 235 million people are spread out across an archipelago about the same distance as New York from Los Angeles. Nearly half of all Indonesian workers support their families by fishing or farming, and many are devout Muslims. In fact, Indonesia is the most densely populated Muslim nation in the world, with more than 200 million adherents to the Islamic faith. Portuguese missionaries brought Roman Catholicism to Eastern Indonesia by mid-1500. And the Dutch East India Company, attracted by the riches of the Spice Islands, established trading posts starting in 1602. Dutch missionaries followed and brought Protestant Christianity to the Maluku Islands and elsewhere in Eastern Indonesia. For the most part, Christians and Muslims lived side by side in peace until everything changed at the dawn of a new century. Paradise was supplanted by jihad. When 2,000 Jihad militiamen attacked my village of Sara, we Christians were small in number and overwhelmed. I took my mother, wife and two children into the jungle for safety. We became quite fatigued, so we stopped to rest under a big tree. My mother was frightened and she urged us all to pray. I kept praying for God's protection because we sensed we were all going to die at the hands of the Laskar Jihad troops. We then continued on deeper into the jungle. We had been running the jungle for two days. My eight-year-old son Cristianto was hungry and crying for food and water. So my brother-in-law and I left the family to search for some fish at our nearby river. Suddenly out of the foliage, if out of nowhere, a squadron of Jihad troops appeared. I tried to protect my family, but became overwhelmed with the radical Muslims. In the struggle, I was separated from my family. From a distance, I saw them captured and heard my darling 10-year-old daughter, Christina, crying out for help, shouting, Father, help us! But I had no power or strength to ward off the multitude of Jihad soldiers. One of the troops threw a grenade at me, and I ran away, but later fell unconscious down a ravine. When I regained consciousness, I prayed that God would protect my family and give me strength to continue on. I met up with my brother-in-law at nightfall. We managed to return to the scene of my family's capture. It was pitch black and we could see nothing. We began to feel the ground for bodies. To my horror, I discovered the bodies of my mother and mother-in-law. A few feet away, I found the body of my dear eight-year-old son, Cristianto, lying in a pool of blood. Their bodies had been hacked with sabers. I found their Bibles, three of them, near their bodies. All but one had been ripped into pieces, and the pages scattered over their bodies. I cried uncontrollably and asked God to give me extra strength to overcome this tragedy. I believed God still loved me and my family and would never leave us. I remembered the scripture verse that said, if we become followers of Christ, we not only gain salvation and joy, but also the gift of suffering. Meitu is not alone. Thousands of Indonesian Christians have lost their lives since the recent wave of terror against them started in late 1998. More than 150,000 people in the Maluku Islands and Sulawesi have been left homeless. Christian villagers have been robbed. Their homes, businesses, and churches burned. Hundreds of churches have been closed or destroyed in recent years. Many Christians have reported being forced to renounce their faith. And some, even women and young children, have been forcibly circumcised following their conversion to Islam. The Indonesian army reportedly encouraged and may have been involved in some of the attacks. Christians feel at the very least, the army often looked the other way and did little to help defend the Christians from attack. The violence intensified after the formation of the radical Islamic group Lasker Jihad in January 2000. Attacks against Christians continue despite the disbanding of Lasker Jihad and the signing of two peace accords between Muslim and Christian leaders in Sulawesi and Ambon. Many feel God has spared their lives for a reason. Johannes Montanhari is one of them. When 500 Jihad troops raided my village, we Christians were overwhelmed. I tried to escape, but they caught up with me. They asked me if I would convert to Islam. They said if I did not become a Muslim, they would kill me. I told my captors I did not want to convert to Islam. I said, just kill me. 
One of the Lascar Jihad troops struck my ear with a samurai sword. Then he sliced into my left shoulder and forearm and back and finally into the back of my neck. When they were cutting me with the samurai, I cried out to the Lord to help me. And they said, why do you shout to the Lord? Your Lord cannot save you from us. After the Muslims cut me, they covered my body with banana leaves and they tried to light them on fire, but the leaves were too green and would not burn. In their frustration, before they left, the Jihad troops stabbed me with a samurai sword, this time striking me in my back and legs. I inched my way along the ground until I found refuge in a nearby cave. Weak and bleeding from his wound, Johannes stumbled through the jungle for eight days, crying out for help. He was finally discovered by his brother-in-law and was taken to the hospital for medical treatment. While I lay weak and bleeding in the jungle, I prayed to God saying, I could not bear this trial anymore. I begged him to take my life, but I felt him telling me, this is not your time to leave this world. Today, Johannes sees the multiple scars on his body as badges of honor for Jesus. He says he forgives his attackers as our Father in heaven forgives us. He takes Jesus' command in Matthew 6.15 seriously. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He rejoices knowing his sufferings have helped grow his character, and that has given him hope. We Christians are encouraged by Johannes' example. We know that the testing of our faith brings about perseverance. Johannes has attended Bible school, where he studied evangelism. He's joined a medical missions team to help provide urgent care to Indonesians in remote areas. I believe God allowed all this to happen to me because He wanted to change my life and use me for His purposes. Before this happened, I never dreamed I'd be an evangelist. Now, I want to be a missionary to the people of Halmahara. I pray for my attackers, that God will bless them. I want to see them again. I will thank them for attacking me and tell them that because of them, I have become close to God. The author of the book of Hebrews writes, Christians must persevere to run the race God has marked out for us. But persevering through adversity and various trials and tribulations does not come easy. Metu's heart ached daily as he searched for clues to discover what had become of his wife Adele and daughter Christina. He agonized over his loss and cried out to God for answers. Because I did not find the bodies of my wife Adele and daughter Christina, I was hopeful they had survived the attack and were still alive. I prayed that God would protect them and reunite us. I prayed daily and believed in God's power to return them to me, in His way and timing, not mine. I never gave up hope. Two months after the attack, one of my friends came to my house. He was excited and said he had good news for me. He had seen Adele and Christina on another island. They had been kidnapped by Lascar Jihad terrorists. Praise God, they were still alive. I took some of my friends and went to that island. There were more than 1,000 Muslim Lascar Jihad troops there. The leader of the Lascar Jihad demanded that we convert to Islam. He said if we did not, we would be killed. He also said I could not get my wife and daughter back unless I became a Muslim. We prayed and afterwards I told the jihadists, even though you want to do bad things to my family, I am a follower of Christ, and my faith in Jesus is of much more value than anything you could offer me. It's more precious than gold. Matthew chapter 10 verse 33 came to mind. Jesus said in that verse, If you disown me before men, I will disown you before my Father in heaven. When I turned my back on my wife and daughter and walked away, I still believe God would reunite us someday. Three months later, I was eating lunch with my friend at a small restaurant. I could tell by the look on his face that something was troubling him. He broke the news to me that my wife Adele had been forced to marry a Muslim man. When I heard the news, I cried. But even though my wife had married a Muslim, I still loved her very much. Nearly one year had passed since the attack and my wife's capture. Just before Christmas, I received a letter from Adele. I opened it up and hurt my heart to learn that my wife was forced to service the sexual desires of her Muslim husband and later became pregnant by him. 
I could not read all the pages of the letter. I was devastated, but I prayed that the Lord would give me strength to face this hurtful reality. Adele wrote that she felt she had become a traitor to me and God, but I didn't view her as a traitor and I knew God would forgive her and reunite us someday. After the Laskar Jihad kidnapped me, I married a Muslim man because I had been threatened by the terrorists, not just once, but many times. They used to come to the home where I was being held. The door was locked, but they broke the door and the window opened and forced me to sleep with them. They forced me to marry this one Muslim man, and I became pregnant and gave birth to my daughter, Sarah. If I had refused to marry this man, there was a possibility that all the other Christians being held would have been killed. So I sacrificed my own feelings to save the lives of the others. I still considered Methu as my one true husband, even though I was married to this Muslim man. I still loved Methu, and I believed one day in God's time I would be reunited with Methu. I was very ashamed of myself and was scared of being rejected by Methu. I remembered what the pastor said the day we were married in church. He said no one could separate us but God. Only God alone can separate man and woman as husband and wife. I believed in that because it wasn't just the word of the pastor, but the word of God to me and Methu. When I found out I was pregnant, I did everything I could think of to abort the child. I drank poisons and all kinds of pills. I tried to fall on my stomach, but nothing worked. I attempted suicide several times because I did not want to live with the shame of returning to my village with another man's baby. One day, in my deepest despair, I tried to stab my womb to kill myself and the baby. My 10-year-old daughter, Christina, came in the room and stopped me. She held me tight and said, Mom, if you go away, who will take care of me? As we sobbed together, she pleaded with me not to do it. God helped me realize I was wrong. He had a beautiful plan for me and my baby. Attacks on Christian villages became commonplace throughout the Malukus and Sulawesi. Hundreds of people were kidnapped, many were forced to flee. Mostly women and even children became victims. Yubelina was among those helping the homeless and fleeing Christians. I was part of a group of Christian refugees who had fled Muslim attacks on their villages. One day, while I was taking a nap, radical Muslims attacked our village. I woke up and found myself all alone. I heard gunfire and grenades and a sudden roar of flames from homes burning close by. I didn't want the Muslim raiders to use my kerosene lamp to burn down the house I was in, so I tried to blow out the lamp. In all the commotion as I attempted to flee, the lamp spilled scorching hot kerosene on me. My face, my chest and hand were burned. I was in excruciating pain and agony, but I had to escape the attackers. I ran and hid under a nearby bridge and cried out to God, Lord, I know I am a sinner, but please spare my life and help me so I can meet up with my husband and children. My mouth was blistered, and I didn't have the strength to speak. Christians found me and took me to a clinic. On the way, I sang a song based on the scripture from the book of Psalms. Whatever happens in your life, God is still with you. After the accident, I was shocked when I first saw my burned and scarred face in a mirror. I cried and cried because I was afraid if I went outside, people would laugh at me. I prayed to God. I know my face looks ugly, but please do something to my face so people will not mock me. My mother urged me not to cry. She said, even if your friends laugh at you, realize that this is a trial that God has given you. Before the accident, I rarely read the Bible. I think God allowed this to happen to me so I would grow closer to Him. Eubelina's soul was healed and she grew stronger in the Lord but her body still bared the scars of the jihad waged against her. She couldn't stand to look at her reflection in the mirror. She knew she possessed and demonstrated an inner beauty and gentleness. 
but she was embarrassed to show her face. Our village of Duma had been repeatedly attacked by radical Muslims. Many of us Christians sought safety in the church, but the building became surrounded by the Laskar Jihad troops. We escaped from the church when the jihadists began throwing bombs and grenades inside and set it on fire. I ran up to an Indonesian army soldier for protection and asked him to help my husband who was dying from injuries he had received from the terrorists. The soldier withdrew a pistol from a holster on his hip and shouted at me, I will help your husband if you follow Mohammed. Do you want to follow Christ or Mohammed? I told him, I am a Christian and I want to follow Christ. Once again he demanded, Are you sure you want to follow Christ? I said yes. I was not afraid because I was ready to die. I knew I'd rather die in Jesus than live as a Muslim. He put the pistol up against my face and said, One more time, Muhammad or Christ? I responded, Jesus. That's when he pulled the trigger. Because there are many, many persecutions come to the Christian and the church, I think it makes our faith is grow up. Yeah. Because uh, the Bible says the faith is grow because of the persecution and reading the Bible. These Indonesian pastors agree. When Christians step in to pray and help with spiritual and material assistance, the result is a fellowship of suffering among Christians around the world. Never the church has been united like this before, before the persecution. Neither Sutarsi nor Yubelina had enough money to pay for much needed medical attention. No doctor with the required surgical expertise resided in the remote villages. The OM Medical assessed the condition of the two women and decided to help. Before the last two surgeries, I could only eat porridge and couldn't talk. I had to write down everything I wanted to say. Now I can talk and eat. I want to say thank you to all the Christians who helped make this possible. Once again, I can eat normally and because of my surgeries, now when I look at my face, I realize I am prettier than before. It's God's grace that He's using VOM and Christians in America to help me, and I am thankful. I think it's just a, a, a worthy ministry to uh, minister to persecuted Christians, and the Lord tells us to do that. And in Galatians 6, 9, and 10, it says not to weary of doing good, especially to those who are in the house of faith. VOM's work in Indonesia isn't limited to medical work. In recent years, we've delivered more than 7,000 life packs to Christian refugees. Each pack contains a small cook stove, cooking pots and utensils, mosquito nets and other essential items for those who have lost all their possessions. Included in each pack is a Bible and other Christian literature to strengthen believers in their spiritual walk. The Voice of the Martyrs has also partnered with other ministries to rebuild churches and homes destroyed in the Jihad. We also help Indonesian pastors through our pastor support program. Families of Martyrs are given support through VOM's Families of Martyrs Fund. VOM also helps pay the school fees of Christian children like these who've lost one or both parents as a result of attacks. Beyond the practical support given, a spiritual union exists. There's a fellowship of suffering. Believers are strengthened and encouraged when they discover that Christians around the world care for them and pray for them regularly. These courageous persecuted believers are willing to pay any price for Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. They never lose hope. Adele managed to escape from her captors. God answered my constant prayer and finally reunited me with my wife and new daughter, Sarah. I was later able to rescue my daughter, Christina, from captivity. Adele was afraid that I could no longer love her because she had forcibly married one of her Muslim captors and had his child. But I told her that she could have 100 children by 100 men and she would still be my wife. And I would always love her.